Welcome to the next session of AAIS Pulse. Thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, our topic today is going to be the weather. Uh, so that weather is one of the most common topics of conversation, but instead of talking about whether we should bring our umbrella tomorrow, we're going to be talk talking about real impacts of extreme weather and climate change. And to shed some light on the science behind weather and climate, I'm pleased to be joined by research scientist and hurricane expert, Dr. Phil Klotzbach, PhD, from the Department of Atmospheric Science at Colorado State University. Thanks for joining me today, Phil. Thanks so much for having me, Mike. Uh, got a good uh, snowstorm uh, just about getting underway here and uh, along the front range of Colorado. So uh, um, don't know if you necessarily want an umbrella, but it's going to be uh, probably six to 12 inches of snow here along the front range. So a pretty good snowstorm setting up. Maybe some good skiing in your future. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. So definitely be some skiing. <laughs> Excellent. Well, before we really jump in, um, as a reminder to our live viewers, uh, you can submit questions via the Showtime app. Uh, there's a comment section at the bottom of the page. If you're not seeing that comment section, please try refreshing the page and hopefully it'll appear. All right, so Phil, the first uh, topic, uh, just climate change in general. Uh, I feel like people have some sort of emotional reaction when they hear that term, it's a little bit charged. Um, is climate change science? Is it opinion? It, it, why is there even a debate? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's a lot of, like a lot of things that's kind of gotten politicized. Um, so basically the whole theory with climate change is as humans produce carbon, is basically the human induced contribution to the increase in carbon dioxide. How is that altering the climate? So if you go back to like the late 1800s, but parts per million carbon dioxide was about 280. Now we're sitting at about 420. So we've gone up by about 50% of what we were say about 140 years ago. And with that, we've seen a global temperature rise of about eight, nine tenths of a degree Celsius. Um, and so the question is, you know, Eight, nine tenths of a degree Celsius, one, one and a half degrees Fahrenheit, you know, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but it's then how that kind of overall temperature increase then alters the extremes, um, which we talk about things like heat waves. Um, and obviously what I focus on is, you know, how will climate change impact hurricanes? And it's not just the impact on hurricane intensity, but it's also uh, the impact on tertiary things such as sea level rise, um, and a warmer atmosphere holding more moisture, being able to yield more rainfall. There's a lot of questions regarding the climate change that we're very actively working on right now. Oh. Now, as you're capturing a lot of these metrics, you know, sea levels, uh, temperatures, ice melt, those types of things, um, I'm kind of looking at the past 20 to 30 years worth of data and the events that have happened. Um, you know, it might seem like there's a, a, a change in frequency. There's more frequency of major hurricanes tornadoes, even wildfires, which of course uh, hits close to home to you in Colorado with the recent Marshall Fire uh, at the beginning of the year. But, but as you study these events and the history, do you find that there's an increasing trend in the frequency of tornadoes, hurricanes, and, and other catastrophic events? Yeah, so um, with wildfires, we certainly are seeing an increase the last few years, especially in these really high impact wildfires. Um, and there's with all these different things with, um, with wildfires, there's a lot of different components that go into it. So you obviously have um, increasing temperatures, which obviously when you have warmer temperatures that can exacerbate uh, wildfire risk. You also have um, some places where you've had pro pronounced drought. So for example, Colorado, we had a very, very wet um, February, March through about June, and then it got really, really dry. And we had really no snow in December. So when the Marshall Fire came at the end of December, um, everything was just very, it was just extremely dry. And Marshall Fire was started in grass, but very quickly became almost an urban fire, just given it spread from house to house. And there were, and they were extremely densely populated house networks where that fire really got going. Um, with wildfires, we also are dealing with um, 50, 60 years now of basically wildfire suppression. Um, and so if you suppress wildfires, eventually something's going to happen. Obviously, Marshall Fire is a little different because it was more of a grass fire than um, some of the big fires you saw in California that were much more, um, obviously, crown fires, tree fires. A lot of that was more wildfire suppression. That was one of the big instigators there. With tornadoes, um, we are seeing an increase of tor in tornadoes, but they're mostly on the low end, so the weaker tornadoes. And a lot of that is due to both Doppler radar, which allows us to better be able to observe these um, tornadoes remotely, but also just due to the fact we have much better technology, we have a lot more people storm chasing. So we're observing a lot more tornadoes than we used to. I was called the twister effect, one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite uh, weather movies there. So you do, you do see that now with hurricanes, 
In the Atlantic, we've actually been in an increased period for overall Atlantic hurricane activity since the middle 1990s. If you go back from the 1970 to 94, it tended to be quieter. And then if we, went, if we go back into the 50s and 60s, it was much more active. But if we take a step back, because we obviously have hurricanes in the Atlantic, but we also have hurricanes in the eastern North Pacific. So off of the west coast of Mexico, we have typhoons in the western North Pacific, which are the same as hurricanes, just called by a different name. And we also have tropical cyclones in the southern hemisphere. If you look in the last, over the last 30 years, the Atlantic trend is going up and everywhere else is actually, every, most other places are actually going down. So overall, if we look at the number of storms, we haven't really seen much of a trend, but we are seeing potentially a trend in the intensity of those storms, that the strongest storms are getting a bit stronger. Interesting, interesting. So, so even if frequencies aren't necessarily increasing, the severity is, is increasing. Now, how does that impact you know, insurance losses or jam, damage to property? Yeah, and so there's a lot of factors. So if you look at the damage from hurricanes or from most perils, but especially from hurricanes, you see this huge increasing trend. And most of that trend is simply due to increases in exposure, more people, more stuff effectively in harm's way. So certainly if you go back to a state like Florida, you go back to the 1940s, from 1945 to 1950, South Florida was hit by five category four hurricanes in six years. But in the 1940s, we didn't have air conditioning, not that many people lived in Florida. So these hurricanes were really devastating for the people that lived there, but there weren't many people there. Whereas obviously we know the population of Florida, Texas, the Gulf Coast, the East Coast has skyrocketed. So there's a large increases in exposure. And that's most of the increase in damage to this point has been just simply due to more people in, in harm's way. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the intensity of hurricanes, how that relates to climate change is a bit more is a bit challenging because there's a lot of factors that go into how strong a storm gets. But we do know sea level is rising. So even if the storms didn't change at all, just the background sea level being six inches to maybe a, in the future being a foot higher, that can cause a lot more inundation. So that storm surge, the wind driven wall of water effectively that comes in with the storm, that wind driven increase in water can penetrate further inland. And we know we don't need, you don't need six feet of salt water in a house to condemn it. You know, six inches to a foot can be enough to condemn a house. So they, we know we're gonna see likely more inundation from storms in the future, even if the storms themselves didn't change. Also with a warmer atmosphere, um, warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. Therefore, we do expect to see more rainfall from hurricanes. And obviously, as we saw from Hurricane Ida, Florence, Harvey, all these storms, you know, when you have these really tremendous uh, rainfall events, obviously flooding can be a huge problem. And certainly we saw with Ida, it doesn't necessarily have to be even near the coast. You can have interactions with the mid latitude system and cause tremendous flooding well inland. Well, so, I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, the same storm happening today versus you know years ago and it would be more intense storm you'd have more damage just because of other factors going into it do you do you feel like there's some sort of cause for alarm you know even if the frequency of storms isn't increasing just the nature of what is there today in the storm's path do you feel like there might be a population shift away from some of these areas i, I know we all love our beaches and mountain views uh things like that do you feel like this um <laughs> is something we should be aware of and you might start seeing a population shift in the future I mean, we haven't really seen anything to date. I mean, certainly we obviously saw after Katrina in New Orleans, the population dropped and the population is coming back. Um, there, there have been cases in the past, like, like Indianola, Texas in the late 1800s was hit several times very hard by hurricanes and then basically the town no longer exists. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of this is, we do know how we can build in areas where we do get hurricanes, we get tornadoes and we can build properties, especially with hurricanes that can withstand the winds. Um, really, the key is elevation of structures. If you want to live on the beach, that's fantastic, but don't have your house one foot above sea level. You know, you can elevate the first floor, um, basically have build up high enough such that you're out of the storm surge zone. We saw after the Galveston hurricane in 1900, they actually elevated most of the city. They actually went and elevated the city and they put in the seawall. And that seawall for Galveston actually protected it quite well during, um, during um, um, why can't I think of the name? Um, the hurricane in 2008, Hurricane Ike in 2008, um, that caused all that storm surge. But most of the storm surge um, that impacted the seawall, basically the storm surge that went in that impacted the seawall in that area wasn't that particularly impacted. But as you went further east, the area that didn't have the seawall was very significantly impacted. So we can build safer, build smarter. Um, and that's really, I think, what we need to be doing with these storms because I, I tend to think even without climate change impacts, we're not really prepared for what we've seen in the past uh, from these storms. 
you know, talking about building back and kind of brings me to uh, government involvement and how they um, you know, have certain programs in place, like the National Flood Insurance Program, um, a lot of pieces of legislation, policies that are aimed at um, you know, insurance losses and mitigating uh, those losses. I know many coastal states right now are implementing regulations regarding hurricane deductibles or roofing replacements with fortified construction, things like that. Um, do you believe they're doing the right things or could they be doing more? I mean, I think really one of the things to try to emphasize is, you know, it's it's so much better to be proactive and to take these mitigation efforts before the storms come than, you know, because people are like, oh, I have insurance. And then, yeah, insurance will help you know, help you recover, but it's so much easier if you don't ever have to leave your house. So, you know, things like roof tie downs are not that expensive. And also when you do this, you can wrap it into the cost of your mortgage oftentimes. And then, you know, you're not paying, you know, a $5,000 expense right up front when you wrap it into a mortgage, it's a fairly small um, monthly payment. And so, you know, it's, it's these things like, I think the thing is, People will have insurance and say, oh, well, I'm insured and that's fine. But it, and it is, but it's much, much better never to be disturbed in the first place and just be able to stay in your house. Because especially from the wind, we can build structures that can withstand most of the winds you're going to impact, that you're going to experience in a hurricane. It's really the storm surge often that you need to actually evacuate from. That's kind of the old adage is that you uh, run, run, that you shelter from the wind and you run from the water. Um, and so that, I think there's there's things that we can that people can do as as property owners. Um, and I think also too, you know, when it comes to government, um, you know, like if, if FEMA say is paying three times for the same property over the span of five years, you know, maybe we shouldn't be building right back in the exact same spot, the exact same way that we should be trying to, um, you know, build back better and build back smarter, such that when these events do come along in the future, even if they are a little bit stronger, that we're much better prepared for them. And so, you know, we've seen, thankfully, with these storms, the loss of life has gone down tremendously due to improved warning systems um, over, say, the last 50 to 100 years, but the damage is still going up. And hopefully, we can start to kind of curtail that increase in damage just by building um, in ways that are um, better in touch with uh, the uh, events that we are likely to be experiencing. You, know, you talk about building codes um, and you know, policies and enforcing building, building codes. Do you feel like the building codes, even if they're there, it still relies upon someone to enforce those codes, that it's it's up to par, right? Um, do you think there's a, an opportunity for, for insurance carriers when they're doing inspections to kind of support that in, in maybe a, a better way going forward? Yeah, I think that's a really excellent point is that, yes, I mean, we have building codes and building codes, basically building code is the bare minimum these structures should be built to, but a building code is only as good as the enforcement of those codes. And there are places where necessarily the building, the building codes may not, if the building codes aren't being enforced, then you can have the best building codes on the planet, but if no one's enforcing them, then, then they're useless. And so I think there is, you know, especially with insurance, they can help kind of um, vet some of these things and see, you know, are these building, this, this county say has really good building codes, are these structures that are being built up to those codes. Um, some places are very good in enforcement, especially places like South Florida. And we saw with Hurricane Irma in 2017, which made landfall on the on the, uh, on the the west coast of Florida, got very strong winds on the east coast. And the buildings in general held up fairly well, uh, which is what we would hope because a lot of buildings on the east coast are new um, over the last 15, 20 years. And so those buildings with the new building codes that came in after Hurricane Andrew did hold up fairly well to some pretty strong winds. So ideally in the future, you know, as since we know how to build in, in ways that are safer, that we can um, start again, start to mitigate some of this damage um, in the future from hurricanes. Excellent. And just a reminder to our viewers, feel free to um, add questions or comments uh, in the chat boxes below. Um, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and talk about models. Um, so in the actuarial world, lots of models, uh, loss cost models, reserving models, catastrophe models. Your work involves developing weather models. Um, but anytime I talk about models and their accuracy, I'm always reminded of a quote from a, a British statistician, George E.P. Box, who said, um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So uh, can you just describe to me what goes into your weather models or even a cap model and what ways you you find them useful? Yeah, and so what I do, I, so I work at Colorado State and our focus, so one of the products we put out every year is seasonal hurricane predictions. So we try to predict before the hurricane season starts, how active the season is going to be. And we use a lot of statistics to be able to do this. We look at historical weather patterns, historical climate patterns, and basically look for effectively what's known as precursor signals. Basically, what sets of conditions or typically there prior to an active season, and alternatively, what sets of conditions 
were there prior to an inactive season. And we tend to find that there's basically a recurring set. So if you're gonna have an active season, in general, you have warmer water in the Atlantic Ocean because warmer water provides more fuel for hurricanes. You tend to have less of what's known as vertical wind shear, which is the change in wind direction and speed with height in the atmosphere. Too much of that shear, if the winds are really, or if you have too much shear, it basically tears apart hurricanes. We also look very closely at the El Nino phenomena. El Nino is warmer than normal water in the eastern and central tropical Pacific. If, if, if it's the um, opposite set, if it's colder there, it's known as La Nina. That's a really big driver of Atlantic hurricane activity as well. When you have El Nino, that tends to increase up winds at high levels in the atmosphere and tear apart Atlantic hurricanes. So we use a variety of these different techniques to come up with our seasonal forecast. So we use a lot of statistics. Um, when it comes to catastrophe models, um, these catastrophe models are what is used to set um, rates uh, for um, homeowners. And so these, these catastrophe models use historical rates, uh, which are based on historical hurricane data. So how often, you know, basically looking at say the last, so usually, usually they start around 1900 and look and say, okay, what are the rates of, you know, what are the odds any year that Miami say is hit by a hurricane or you know, New Orleans or something like that. And then they also have what's known as medium term rates or which are rates estimated for say like the next five years. And those rates can have some challenges because, you know, it's, you, you have the 120 years of data, so you can just use statistics and say, okay, here's if the last 120 years, if the past is predicting the future, then we can calculate a rate. But when you start doing the next five years, you have to start making kind of some basically educated guesses as to exactly what's going to happen over the next five years. And sometimes those rates have worked out fairly well and other times they have it. Um, and so there's there's definitely some some challenges when you're when you're looking at or there's definitely some challenges in the, the catastrophe modeling field because um, they also model in addition modeling rates will also model losses, which is based on the basically the exposure that's there and what the hurricane structure is likely to be when it gets there. And obviously you are, you start you might start running this model five days in advance and you think the storm is going to be, you know, category four hurricane with 140 mile an hour winds and it comes ashore as a category one. Well, your damage is going to be all less because your storm's a lot weaker. And also too, the model estimates are only as good as the um, input data. So if you say that's a wood frame construction and it's actually made of brick, there's differences in how much damage. So they have these damage abil damage ability functions based on the structure, the characteristics of the house. So if you have a shanty, obviously it's not likely to stand up to a strong hurricane. Whereas if you have a well a well built or like a concrete concrete block construction or something, it's much more likely to stand up um, to a hurricane. So there's catastrophe models are, are fairly complicated. Um, I certainly don't under claim to understand all that that goes into it, but it basically is kind of a tool that insurance companies will use to better understand the risks and better be able to understand the potential threat to their portfolio when there's a storm coming ashore. And they also will use kind of like theoretical examples too. Like, okay, say we get a you know medium sized category four hurricane into, into Miami, how much damage will that cause to my portfolio? So we'll do these kind of theoretical exercises as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think, um, you know, in my experience, when you're looking at actuaries, you know, we don't have to be right. We're never going to be right. But you take averages and trying to get in the right direction. Um, and with cat models, it's um, when you run these different scenarios, um, the sensitivity testing is also another important element. So you can look at the relativity between, hey, if we ran this storm versus that storm, what is that difference and how much of an impact would it would it make? Um, so all excellent points. So thanks. Um, now, as you're talking about, um, you know, climate change and all the things that you're studying, are there any things that keep you up at night, um, you know, like you know, concerns about the future of climate change going forward, you know, simple, complicated, anything that um, that, that worries you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I think about hurricanes all the time, so that's kind of where, where I focus on. And I mean, to me, really, it's, it's, it's not even the climate change, it's just having spent, you know, 20 years studying historical hurricanes is knowing what we've seen in the past. And even, even if the storms didn't change at all, and we get some of these historical hurricanes that we've seen in the past and you run those through today. For example, there's what's known as the Great Miami Hurricane of 1926, which was a media, was a pretty, was a large in size category four hurricane slammed into downtown Miami. Now, 1926, the population of Miami-Dade County was about 100,000 people. Now it's 2.7 million people. So that storm today is estimated to cost, you know, 200 plus billion dollars in damage. And so that's 
Again, that's just a storm that we've observed before. So if that storm were to reoccur, let alone obviously if you say climate change makes it a little bit stronger or something, then you even have a bigger problem. But you know, it's storms like that that we've seen in the past that really do make me nervous. And you think about a storm like Hurricane Irma in 2017. You know, Irma was obviously devastating for the Caribbean, um, but Irma obviously caused a lot of impacts in the U.S., but it certainly could have been much, much worse if things had just played out slightly differently. Irma tracked a little south of due west when it was approaching Florida, went over Cuba, and that took off a lot of, it took out a lot of the steam of the storm. And then also when it was recurving up to the Florida Keys, the models were taking it a little further west and then bringing it, making landfall near Sarasota, whereas instead it made landfall near Naples. And so all the storm surge went into, instead of the storm surge going up into Naples and Fort Myers, which is, an extremely storm surge prone area went into the Everglades. And so it caused a tremendous amount of damage, but had it gone 100 miles further north, 50 miles further north, and all that storm surge got into Fort Myers and Naples, the damage could easily have been two to three times what it was with just a very subtle shift in storm track. So certainly the U.S. has been very significantly impacted by hurricanes, obviously Ida this past year, and then Laura and a bunch of other hurricanes in 2020. And then we go back to Florence and Michael and Harvey and all these storms. But, you know, we, we still... We still necessarily haven't necessarily seen like a worst case scenario. There are still storms that we've either seen in the past that could cause even more damage than the damage that we've seen in recent years. Mm -hmm. And if you see the kind of the traje trajectory of climate change, and it's very, very long term, um, and it's obviously a, a focus of conversation. And some corporations have been hesitant to kind of discuss it or kind of they've ignored it. Uh, it seems like there's somewhat of a transition uh, recently towards being vocal about it, addressing it and saying, yes, we, we, we understand that it's, it's an issue. Um, Larry Fink at BlackRock, for example, their investment management firm, now they're committed to try and making a difference going forward to 2050. Um, what do you, what's your take on corporations that are trying to pay, you know, take charge in, in this kind of a, a movement? Yeah. I mean, I think it's really important to, you know, really understand the risks and what, what, um, what you might be looking at going forward. And with these climate models, I mean, I've, I've done a fair amount of work with them. I mean, there is a lot of uncertainty. So, you know, when you, you hear like the, the United Nations saying, you know, we need to cap CO2 at a specific level to prevent two degrees Celsius warming. We honestly don't know for sure. There's no like these models, like you said, they're all wrong. Some are useful. And so we don't we don't really know. And, you know, all these scenarios going forward, like we have no idea what technological changes are going to happen in the next 50 to 100 years. Maybe we'll come up with some fantastic carbon sequestration technique that we can pull all the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Like we just don't know what's going to be coming next. Um, but I think certainly, you know, we can take action. Basically, we, we're better off taking actions now and starting to really invest in not only development of other energy sources, but also in terms of improving energy efficiency with what the, because basically all energy sources, even the ones that are called clean energy, there's something that goes into them. Batteries obviously require um, mining and you know a lot of rare earth minerals. So there's nothing that's perfect. So I think really one of the keys is improving the efficiency of the energy sources that we already do have um, and improving just energy efficiency with basically things that use less energy than, than, than used to. So I think there's a lot of um, you know technological improvements that will that will come along. I mean, I think you know, climate change is certainly a problem, but I, I tend to be a little more optimistic in that we do have a lot of really smart people working on this. And so to act like it's 2022, that we're not going to come up with anything technologically in the next 30 years to help mitigate climate change's impacts, I think is a little bit, it just seems like a stream unlike scenario, we're certainly going to come up with some things, but obviously climate change is, is a real concern. So I think really investing in ways that we can um, both hopefully reduce its impacts, but also mitigate against what we might be seeing in the future is, is important. And the other thing I always emphasize with climate change and with human impacts is that it's more than just um, it's more than just the impacts from CO2. Humans can make things better or worse. It has nothing to do with CO2, like land use changes. If you concrete a bayou and put a bunch of houses in there, an area that formerly you could have had water running off into now has an impermeable surface, and that will exacerbate flash flooding, even though it's so you have worse flash flooding that's not necessarily CO2 related, it's just due to land use changes. And so I think that stuff we can tackle in some ways a lot easier than climate change, which is kind of a worldwide response that needs to happen. Whereas local changes we can, you can mitigate as a city or as a town. And so I think that's something else I try to emphasize too, is there are things we can do at a smaller scale that I think are a little more manageable to tackle than say like trying to reduce, you know, CO2 emissions of the world is, that's a bit more daunting task. <laughs> 
No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, again, just a reminder, if there are any questions, feel free to submit. It doesn't look like anything's come through. But um, so you talk about climate change and, and things that we're doing to address um, you know, the trend that we're seeing. And you talked about nothing, no, there's no perfect solution, right? Um, even the battery example, you know, you still use electricity, but you know, you have to mine the battery and, and materials in there. How do you um, project or can take that into consideration when, you know, opting for this, this route or this solution, when you, there are so many variables at play where you don't know if you're actually helping or maybe hindering the whole progress of what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's definitely, I mean, I, I focus more on the, uh, you know, on the, on that natural hazard side, as opposed to on like, what's the best energy source going forward. But I think, you know, basically just not necessarily ruling anything out, but looking and seeing realistically, like what we can do with what we have and how are the very, basically, I think, ideally, what I would like is a conversation about every energy source that we have, what are the pros, what are the cons, and, you know, what, basically how things look going forward. I mean, even if you look at like wind turbines, basically wind turbines work. And then when they don't work, what do we do? We bury them in the dirt. So it's not like, it's not like they just magically disintegrate, you know, they're not, they don't compost. So it's every, every energy source has, has some issues. Some are dirtier, you know, than others, but I think trying to basically be smart about the energy portfolio that we use going forward, both the United States as well as around the world, obviously using the energy resources that, Obviously, if you have solar panels and you're living in, you know, northern Manitoba in January, well, there's not really much sun, so solar panels aren't doing you a lot of good. Whereas if you live in a place like Florida or California or Texas, you get a lot of sun. Maybe solar panels are a much more good, much more useful way to go. Having spent, you know, a lot of time in Colorado and a little bit of time in Wyoming, Wyoming probably a great place to put wind turbines because it's windy there all the time. So you know, if you're in if you're in the Bay Area of California, not very windy, so wind turbines probably not doing you a whole lot of good. So trying to be smart about where we, where we site, um, especially the renewable energy sources as well, using the resources that we do have. And that's where meteorologists can come in handy because we can tell you, okay, you know, here's here's where it's sunny a lot, here's where it's windy a lot, and trying to basically site things in the best way possible. <laughs> very good. I'd say I'm, I'm from Chicago, so we're the windy city. It's certainly windy, but I know the name isn't from from the weather. Um, <laughs> So we did get a question. Um, are there any newer emerging technologies that are being used to help better forecast and plan for natural catastrophes? Yeah, I mean, so when it comes to hurricanes, since that's kind of my focus on, um, technology has really, really helped with being able to predict hurricane track and especially hurricane track and somewhat hurricane intensity. Um, the forecast skill that we have today at five days, I think 20 years ago is what we had at three days. So we just, the models basically as computers get better, um, we can run the models that we can run our models that forecast hurricanes at higher resolution. And so the higher resolution models, in addition to some new physical insights, can help us be able to forecast better where storms are going to track. So basically then, you know, we have a, if you look at, so the National Hurricane Center has basically a cone um, when it issues its forecast. And it's the average of the last, was it the five-year average of like two-thirds of all forecast tracks in the last five years will fit in this cone. And that cone is, is shrinking. Um, which is good because that means we have more confidence in general where the storms are going to go now. And it's not to say that every storm behaves perfectly. Some storms are much just harder to forecast given the environment, but overall the track forecasts are getting better. The intensity forecast is still a challenge. We saw that with Hurricane Ida last year, but we are getting better. I mean, the, the Hurricane Center was explicitly forecasting Ida to rapidly intensify as it approached. And you know, even before Ida even got a name, they were really saying this looks like a really serious threat um, for the central Gulf Coast. And the track with Ida was also very close to spot on. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, um, the models have helped. And then also too, we do have really good forecasters at the National Hurricane Center. And, you know, I think about Hurricane Laura last year, which hit made landfall in the Western part of Louisiana. And it was, it was a big impact to Lake Charles, but there was one time where a couple of the models shifted and started taking it more towards Houston. And the forecaster at the time said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to bite on this yet. I don't necessarily think this is going to happen. And, and, and it didn't. But obviously, had he shifted that track and it had gone and, and it said that suddenly now it's going to, you know, a category four hurricane hitting Houston, obviously that would have caused mass panic. So, you know, we, while the models are getting better, we definitely still need a plug for human forecasters because they can yield um, additional insights in addition to what we get from the, uh, from the uh, from the various models that we have. Okay, um, looks like we have one more question. But again, if you don't see the comment box at the bottom, feel free to refresh the page. That should do the trick. Um, but the next question we got in online was, 
how can insurers help rethink energy use? So, <laughs> not I'm to, to think of that one as well. That's, not, that's, that, that, that's definitely a question I've not been asked before. So, uh, kudos on that one. Um, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm trying to, th I mean, it's a lot of it is, you know, investments in trying to make these, these kind of emerging technologies like wind and solar. I mean, they've been around for a long time, but they're still, the amount of energy that's generated from them is still fairly small compared to what we would need. So trying to basically work on improving those, but I think really also improving the batteries and frankly, really the grid that we, the, the electrical grid of the United States is built for kind of consistent energy. So when you have these, you know, like solar is great, but solar isn't there when it's dark outside. So you need to have, it, 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 and same with wind. I mean, you have wind and then you don't have wind. And so it's, it's, it's basically helping to modernize the grid of the United States to be able to handle these energy sources that are more effectively sporadic in nature and then trying to basically be able to figure out ways to, okay, if you have a lot of wind and it's not windy for two or three days, how are you going to kind of handle that, that time where you don't have the wind? You know, you have to have the backup storage. And so I think it's really trying to be smart about all these things with going forward. Um, you know, obviously, these, these energy sources are fantastic. And obviously the sun's gonna be there, the wind's gonna be there, but just being able to be smart about how we handle these kind of sporadic um, energy sources. So anything insurance can do to kind of help with, you know, sponsoring these projects, funding these projects and, you know, supporting supporting the, these uh, various projects as they get underway. Yeah, and, and I'm kind of thinking as, you, as you're talking, it's a lot about how insurers, um, where they enter the economy, right? So when you're replacing a building, can you, you know, maybe have some sort of uh, policies of where materials get sourced? Is there a way to, um, you know, provide sustainable materials as opposed to alternatives that may, may or may not be cheaper? Um, and is that some option that you can have on your policy? So maybe that's one way where it's not a direct energy consumption, but it impacts what energy is being used to get you back whole uh, up and running. So that's my thought. Okay, excellent. Um, well, it looks like that's all, those are all the questions that we've got so far. It's all I had prepared. Um, really, Phil, I appreciate you sharing your insights with us. I'm going to ask you one last question, though. Sure. Um, can you, I know it's early, but can you provide any sort of prediction for this upcoming hurricane season? If not a prediction, just maybe things to watch out for that you're noticing so far. Yeah, so we actually put out our first formal for forecast in about two months on Thursday, April the 7th. Um, and so right now, one of the big things that we're watching is um, El Nino. So right now we have La Nina. So right now we have colder than normal water in the eastern and central tropical Pacific. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the reason that we care what's going on in the Pacific Ocean is because it then impacts the um, winds at high levels in the atmosphere, 20 to 30,000 feet in the atmosphere. So when you have a La Nina, you tend to have less of these your winds are weaker at upper levels in the atmosphere and that tends to help support strong hurricanes. And so the question is, this La Nina that we've had the last few months, is that going to persist through the hurricane season? At this point, that seems fairly unlikely, but the big question is, do we go back to neutral, which basically means neither El Nino nor La Nina, and then it's really important what's going on in the Atlantic, or do we go all the way to El Nino? And so there's, there's some indications that La Nina is weakening. Um, and so typically, it's during the February to May timeframe where if you're going to switch from El Nino to La Nina or vice versa, this is about time of year it happens. So that's something we're going to be monitoring very, very closely. Um, right now, the Atlantic, tropical Atlantic is warmer than normal. So that would tend to support a more active season. But during February, March into April, there's a lot of um, basically this time of year, we have very strong winds blowing across the Atlantic. So if you can get a particular wind pattern, that would tend to support stronger winds blowing across tropical Atlantic that can cause a lot of cooling. And so that's something we're going to be monitoring as well. So we don't have a first forecast yet. We put out a very brief discussion in December, in which case we said it looks like we'll probably have another relatively active season, but we'll know a lot more when we put out our next, when we put out our first formal forecast in April. We do run um, statistical models then, and we also run basically a hybrid model where we use a climate model to forecast conditions for the next few months. And then say, okay, if, the, if that climate model is correct and say conditions in July are a certain way, how does that typically relate for the peak of the Atlantic hurricane season from August to October? So we will have some model guidance that hopefully will lead to a, a, a relatively accurate forecast. Our forecast in 2021 was really, really good. Um, so hopefully we'll have another uh, accurate forecast in 2022. <laughs> 
Excellent. Ho- accurate and hopefully a, a mild, mild season. But that's uh, right. You never, you, we've had six, active, six above normal seasons in a row. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, again, thank you, Phil. I appreciate you joining me today on our session of AAS Pulse. And um, with that, I will throw it back to Ed. Thanks, Mike.